Good evening and warm welcome to all the participants. Uh, we are excited today yet again with a leader, Dr. Dinesh Sharma, who is going to talk about uh, India's innovation journey since 1947. I will, I will not waste any time now. We'll do a brief introduction and quickly hand you over to Dr. Dinesh Sharma. Uh, allow me to share my screen, please. Here it goes. Uh, these are Wise Views uh, leadership conversations. Uh, we've been hosting these conversations over the last two years. And uh, today we are fortunate to have Dr. Dinesh Sharma, uh, who is going to deliver the 105th leadership uh, conversation. And this session is extremely important given the topic that it is going to span on the innovation landscape of uh, this country. Uh, thank you so much, sir, for agreeing to speak with us. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll just do a brief introduction. Yes, after this intro, the talk will begin and we'll have Q&A. Everything should be over in about an hour or 10 minutes or so depending on the questions. Dr. Dinesh Sharma uh, is a journalist and an author. He's an award-winning journalist, author, and media trainer with over 35 years of experience in reporting on science and technology, health and environment for national and international media outlets. Dr. Sharma has been the science editor at Mail Today from 2007 to 2014 and uh, the founding managing editor at India Science Wire from 2017 to 2019. He's a regular contributor to the medical journal, The Lancet, very popular among others. In June, 2008, had the privilege of becoming the first Asian journalist to go to the Arctic to report on an ongoing international scientific expedition relating to climate change. Looks like an adventurist kind of journalist as well. Among his major books, The Outsourcer, The Story of India's IT Revolution, uh, published by MIT Press USA in 2015. The book was awarded the prestigious Computer History Museum Book Prize instituted by the American Society for History of Technology, SHOT, in 2016. He has also penned a science travelogue, Witness to the Meltdown, uh, based on his climate change reportage from the Arctic in 2008. His latest book, Indian Innovation, Not Jugaad, is about 100 innovations that have transformed India in the past 75 years. As the Jawaharlal Nehru Fellow 2020 to 2021, he is working on the evolution of Hyderabad as a technology cluster. This is very interesting for all the folks who joined from Hyderabad. The book is slated for publication in 2023, that is this year. Uh, Dr. Dinesh's academic experience includes uh, teaching a course in development journalism for MA students at Ateneo de Manila University, Philippines, and being a teaching fellow at the JNU. He's a doctorate from Banaras Hindu University and a postgrad from uh, Osmani University, where I also studied. So thank you once again, sir. Uh, thank you very much for uh, joining us. Uh, we welcome uh, you to handle this session and uh, take us through the landscape of innovation since 1947. And uh, before that, uh, I'll just take one more moment to introduce my esteemed colleague. Uh, Professor R. Prasad is the director of academic wing at ICFI Group. Uh, he brings three decades of rich experience as an entrepreneur before uh, getting into the corporate world. Uh, as an entrepreneur, corporate professional, now as an academic. Uh, he has teaching and research experience of 21 years out of these three decades. He has obtained his B.Tech from uh, the prestigious IIT Bombay and a PGDM from IIM Kolkata. He has published several articles, edited books, and presented papers in India and abroad. And we will stop uh, sharing the screen here. And we once again thank you, sir, for your time. And we request you to uh, commence your talk. Uh, you can share the screen, and uh, we'll I'll just go on mute, and we'll all uh, hope to enjoy learn from you, sir. Thank you once again. Thank you. Thanks for having me, uh, Sudhakar Raugaru and uh, Professor Prasad. It's a nice uh, landmark, I suppose, in this series. You said 150th uh, you know, talk today evening. So it's uh, my privilege to be part of this whole series. And I hope you will find the, whatever I have to say interesting. There are a lot of connections, as you said. I have my, I had my education in Hyderabad. So that's... Uh, uh, one connection and I'm of course I'm writing the book on Hyderabad so maybe sometime later this year we could have an opportunity to talk about it and I did give a couple of talks on that subject and uh, while I was writing the book so and it's a kind of a not an extension 
but kind of a spillover of the work which I did on the IT industry. And at that time, I did not look at how individual clusters develop. So in this book, I'm trying to look at uh, Hyderabad. So that's the work I'm currently engaged with. So as uh, Sudhakar has said that today's uh, topic uh, is India's innovation journey since 1947. Some people may find it a bit uh, surprising that uh, did India start innovating in 1947 or was it something else? Or uh, does innovation journey started, uh, uh, did it start just in recent times? So I'll uh, dwell on some of these uh, points as we go ahead and I'll try to keep my presentation brief and uh, illustrate with whatever I have to say with some examples so that, you know, uh, instead of getting into theorization because I'm not a academician to theorize about how innovation works, but yeah, I'm going to illustrate my points through some examples. So as we stand uh, today, it's the 75th year of Indian independence. We have traveled a long journey since 1947. So where does uh, India stand today? I'll try to give some brief uh, snapshots without going into, you know, uh, great details, like uh, life expectancy at birth is a major indicator. So India stands at uh, 70 plus years today. The literacy rate is close to 80%. These are a couple of years old figures, 77.7. So agriculture exports, India exports about uh, $50 billion of agriculture uh, commodities every year. And, and people in Hyderabad would be very familiar that India is a large exporter of uh, affordable medicines and vaccines throughout the world. And the value was around $25, $25 billion. Though by volume, it is much higher. But since these drugs are cheaper, so the value is a little less. But uh, oh, the key word here is uh, India sells the affordable medicines. They are among the cheapest in the world. And as we all know, we are the second largest market of uh, mobile phones in the world. The users, user base is about 1.2 billion of mobile phones. And there are different figures about how many smartphones are there and how many feature phones are there, but uh, it's a huge number and the exponential growth has been seen in the past uh, few years. So these are some key indicators and some of them are connected with each other. So we'll discuss as we go ahead. I'll just take you back to say 75 years. What was India in 1947 on these key parameters. So some of the figures which I showed in the last slide, so you, you will have to keep them in mind. Say life expectancy at birth was 32 years in 1947. So an average Indian could expect to live only 32 years. Today, the same figure is 70 years plus. Literacy rate, it may not be, it will be very difficult for some of us to believe that it was just about 10%, about 12 to 13%. And that was one of the reasons uh, when the first general elections were held in 1952, it was a big challenge that how do you communicate the names of the candidates to voters? Because if 80% of your people, voters are uh, cannot read and write, how are they going to recognize parties? So that's how this whole you know, system of having symbols to each party and each candidate was evolved. So that has something to do with the low level of literacy. Then agriculture exports were nil. In fact, we are importing a lot of uh, food grains and that's how we had all those uh, names of begging bowl and ship to mouth. And we literally had to wait for the uh, ships with food grains to arrive on Indian shores and so that they can be taken from there to the uh, fair price shop. So it was a pretty bad situation. And medicines, it's again very difficult for the generation of today to believe because uh, they were complete uh, imported. All the essential medicines India used, even till 1940s, 1950s, were all imported. All that Indian companies, they were Indian companies, they did was to import and make them into a kind of uh, package them and retail them here. So they would get the bulk drugs or they'll just get drugs which are just one step uh, uh, below the final product and they'll sell it in India. And it was all dominated by multinational companies. And believe it, they were the costliest in the world. Antibiotics, even till early 60s or late 50s were the costliest in the world. 
uh, Indian market. And again, a surprising figure, it's difficult to you know, fathom that India had just 100,000 phones all over the country. And out of that 35,000 were in Bombay and probably 25,000 in Delhi. So there were about, uh, and rest of the country had about 40,000 phones. So it was an abysmal uh, legacy of the Raj. And, and many times we get carried away that, okay, it's the British who gave us the telecommunications, the telegraph, the railways, the postal system, but they were all the artifacts of a colonial system. I mean, any, every colonial country had them, but did they suffice? Did they have anything to bear? Because when we wanted to develop our own thing, we had a very low base. So from that point to this point, how did this uh, transformation take place? And there are, <clears throat> we all have grown with a lot of, uh, you know, understanding of uh, this journey. And, and it always starts with the planning, you know? They say India had a planned economy. There was a five-year plan. There were, you know, plan for everything. And in fact, India started planning uh, much before independence. In 1938, the National Planning Committee was established under the Indian National Congress to plan for what India would be when it became independent. And there were 38 subcommittees under that, and there were scientists, they were engineers, they were industrialists, everybody was involved in this planning exercise. And so that's how the National Planning Committee became the National Planning Commission. And finally, the national uh, prefix was dropped and it became Planning Commission. So planning did have a big role, but did it, was it all uh, only due to planning? Then again, we hear a lot about science and technology. You know, as we all know that uh, Prime Minister Nehru had this vision of utilizing science and technology as the input for national development. He saw it as, as a part of uh, the process of national development. And that's how the uh, top scientists were close to him. And he himself headed the scientific uh, ministry. It was called the National uh, Natural Resources and Scientific Research Ministry. So was it science and technology? Or was it also some progressive economic policies about the new industrial policy there we had an agriculture policy there were, uh, we had a planning process and then we also had policies was it because of that and again a major factor in the first two decades of india was international aid uh, expertise came from say un agencies united nations unesco who unicef a lot of foreign aid came like IIT in Kanpur was developed as the Indo-American Kanpur project. All the IITs were set up with foreign help. Then the steel plants were set up with the help from Russia. The technology came from Russia. So both blocks we had. So was it because of that? Then we had the large projects, big dams, steel plants, fertilizer plants, you know, heavy engineering. So did the transformation take place because of that? Of course, all these things developed uh, uh, a base of uh, the generated employment. They were necessary for infrastructure building, but uh, among the things which you're talking, was it uh, due to that? And as I said, the PSUs had a big role to play. So all these factors were there at the beginning of 1947 from planned economy to science and technology. But one thing which we often forget, which I feel was a major contributor to this whole process of change was innovation. Although the word might not have been in currency, you know, we were talking of science, we were talking of development, we were talking of planning, but nobody had this uh, uh, co concept of innovation. But I'm uh, conceptualizing to say that, yeah, innovation had a major role to play uh, in this whole process of transformation. The two slides which I showed, you know, the from, 70, uh, from 47 to 2023, I believe that innovation had a, a role to play. And I'm going to, I'm not undermining the role of all these other above factors, but I think we have to take into cognizance that innovation had a, a role to play. And I'm trying to demonstrate to, to that. See, normally there are different notions about how you view innovation. The most common notion, which is again a legacy from the Silicon Valley, is that innovation is technology led. Technology is an essential part of innovation. Partly true, partly may not be true. Let's see. Then in recent decades, 
it has come boiled down to the not only technology it is the digital technology which is uh, necessary for innovation then who drives this innovation in the uh, conventional understanding of innovation it is either the industry the multinational corporations or the entrepreneurs who drive innovation then for innovation to grow there are certain institutional frameworks necessary so you have need to have a, a science technology and innovation national frameworks you need to have a, uh, policies you need to have you know Uh, a base of uh, technical manpower you need to have venture capital so you need those kind of frameworks then uh, again it's a misnomer according to me that public institution the state is not capable of innovation that's again i mean uh, in this uh, framework which is technology led which is driven by entrepreneurs there's no role for state that's normally people believe there's no role for you know organizations other than industry and uh, state of course doesn't come into picture and the, the predominant way of uh, dissemination of uh, innovation and technology based innovation is through markets these are the notions i'm not uh, discounting all of them but what i'm trying to say is innovation is much more than all this and that's what uh, i want to attribute some of the things which i'm going to discuss will follow these attributes so <clears throat> it need not be technology led innovation can be a new idea in marketing innovation can be a new idea of you know uh, a creative way of uh, a service delivery it need not be necessarily technology driven but it technology could be an ingredient of it it can propel but it need not be driven by technology then of course it goes beyond uh, digital technology it could be a service it again need not be always a product a smartphone or a laptop or a, a networking device or whatever it need not be that and then uh, i mentioned you a number of uh, institutional frameworks within which innovation normally takes place but it can occur outside those you know uh, these institutional frameworks which we discussed then of course there is a wide range of players in innovation chain that could be industry startups government non profit citizens today we are living in an era era of crowdsourcing of ideas where people develop things in you know through collaborative means so everybody is a player in this way. and what uh, the innovations which have driven india in the journey of transformation have been social have been people centric and not necessarily just market centric of course market is necessary for a number of things but it is not the sole driver of disseminating those ideas so it could be a combination of say as i said i am not discuss, discounting technology it could be a combination of technology it could be marketing packaging creative policies public policies and citizen participation and what drives the uh, large scale innovations i believe is should be societal needs and not solely profit of course yeah. today also we talk about social entrepreneurship where societal goals are in focus and not uh, profit but you need the, uh, enough money to run a business you run a uh, social business so, so to say so these are the kind of broad attributes i am not discounting the traditional model of looking at innovation but i want you to appreciate these additional features of innovations and i have uh, randomly picked a few examples uh, there is a list of uh, several of them but i'll just demonstrate these with some four or five examples and then we can get into discussion so these are uh, very unique indian innovations i mean i'm sure everybody knows what i'm showing here is an std Uh, ISD booth, and uh, which is uh, which you can find uh, uh, in rural areas, in cities, in the 80s and 90s, and even till now. I'm also using it till now. I'll I'll tell you how in a different format. But what was the innovation in ISD STD booth? As I said, you India had just hundred thousand phones in 47. By 1980, I suppose the number rose to. a few million phones so maybe about 4 to 5 million phones still the problem was that there was a long waiting list technology was outdated and affordability of phones was difficult for a large number of people so how do you you know make a service which is a basic service which was recognized by you had so many ideas by 80s 
that people need access to a telephone service, but there were a political constraint. You could not have privatized. The OT Department of Telecom was a monopoly. And individual phones, there was a long waiting list. And technology was outmoded. So there were three challenges. So this one innovation tried to overcome all the three challenges. Number one, of course, technology was developed indigenously, C dot, which again is an innovation by itself. So at the back end of uh, this uh, STD uh, idea was the small uh, rural telephone exchange, which India developed under C dot. It would work under 45 degrees, you know, uh, temperature also. It would not fail. It did not need AC and all those features it had. It was based on software, modular. Uh, it could be upgraded in a modular fashion. So you had that, but still the connectivity at individual level was the problem. So to solve that, this device was, this innovation was thought of. One option was that, that you need, you have those red booths everywhere, but you, how do you uh, manage those booths in a country like India? People would analyze, take them away, the people don't know how to use it. So you need, they needed to be manned. So how do you have a manned booth? So they tried to give franchise. So this franchise business was the innovation. Here the technology is not the innovation. The franchise was an innovation that while the phone lines were still you know, owned by DOT, so the monopoly of DOT was intact, but the last mile of delivery, the man sitting there was delivering a service which was privatized. So individuals could own a phone and he could provide this service. So they were given a preferential line so that you know you could uh, uh, get a connection easily. So the innovation was a policy innovation. It overcame the monopoly question. So monopoly of DOT was not diluted, but still a service could be provided through a franchise. And he gets a commission, there was a model, and there was a meter. That was a small technological innovation which could uh, give you a display. So it kind of combined several things. So you had technology at the back end, you had the service delivery, which was privatized. The telephone lines were still owned, no privatization there, but you could spread it very easily. It grew rapidly and uh, we all know, and this is something which went all over the world. Many countries in Africa adopted this model and it has uh, lived very many lives. Like after this, uh, the STD booths became the cyber kiosk, no internet kiosk when in the nineties, when the uh, booths came. And still many of those are operational because as more and more services are getting digitized and they serve as a, a service uh, uh, assistance, like people want to book an appointment for a, a passport, they go to them and they'll book. So the phones have been replaced by computers and they're still providing the service. So this model lives. So that's, a, I think, one of the uh, biggest social technical policy marketing innovation that survives and it has gone all over the world. So that's why I feel that that's, uh, I mean, we never, it is so ubiquitous that we never recognize it as an innovation, but it is. And again, in the seventies, this uh, stove uh, people might have seen, it's the, again, uh, in, a, in response to the 1973 oil shock, when uh, imports of uh, kerosene was becoming difficult. So how do you economize on kerosene? Uh, this is the start of energy efficient devices in India. This was the first device, which was again, kind of a technological innovation by Indian Institute of Petroleum, uh, Indian Oil Corporation, and the NID was involved in designing the whole thing. It looks very aesthetic. It had a different burner. It gave you the blue flame. It had a fuel gauge. It had a bigger capacity. So compared to the existing uh, stoves which are used, which had the pressure pumped stove, which are not very safe also, this came as an innovation and it spread. I think in the 70s, almost every house had this, you know, and it saved on fuel. So it led to a kind of a movement for energy conservation. So it was in response to the oil shock. And again, I was surprised when I was researching that the phone, this uh, stove was still used in parts of India till 10 years back. So it is a product, but again, in response to a societal need and it's a, it's developed in a lab. So I don't know how many people can connect with this picture is the, see, I mentioned to you about the literacy and the literacy rates going up and uh, 
health status improving. One of the contributors was that, you know, the improved nutritional status, falling of the uh, infant mortality rate. So all those are connected. So here is one innovation which addressed all that. It's the midday meal scheme. It's a political innovation, I would say. Uh, introduced in uh, uh, Tamil Nadu during Mr. Kamrat's time, then multiplied by, popularized by subsequent uh, Chief Minister of NGR, then adopted in Andhra Pradesh also, and several other states. And now it is part of a large government scheme all over. So look at it, how you arrested the dropout rates. You couldn't have given subsidy for people to stay and eat at home. You can't give dry rations. So several social economic factors were addressed through this scheme that, okay, give them meal at the in the school so that they stay here. It improves their nutritional status. It improves their attention span and you retain them in the school. So that's, a, again, a political innovation which is multiplied. And everybody is familiar with this, the electronic voting machine, uh, again, done in Hyderabad. And this is something which is, uh, I mean, elections in many of the <laughs> developed countries are still held by ballot papers. You see those pictures whenever the elections are held in many countries and it takes several days for uh, even US election results to come. Whereas we had uh, Karnataka elections last uh, week and the results were out. So again, in response to the Indian uh, needs, it was in response to this whole menace of booth capturing you know, in the 70s. So ECIL was given a task. So first they developed this voting system for Lok Sabha. So when the Lok Sabha secretary became the election commissioner, Mr. Shagda, he asked the ECIL that you did it for us in the Lok Sabha. Can you do it for the whole country? So it, a challenge was given to them and in response to that ECIL developed. It, it lives all, despite all the legal and regulatory and all those political issues that and if, like, buildings like these are very familiar. This is the software technology park uh, building in one of the cities, I suppose Bangalore or Hyderabad, I don't know. But this is a, a mega innovation, according to me. If India is big today in uh, IT, uh, services worth $160 billion being exported every year, it is because of this policy innovation. See, I have myself visited uh, some uh, software companies, including Infosys in the 80s, they were very tiny. Companies were operating from houses, operating from, you know, uh, rented premises. They did not even have phones at times, you know. You had still had to go out and some companies would uh, tell me that they don't have a phone because the waiting line is so uh, bad. So how do you send software from, how do we export in such a situation? And of course, Texas Instrument came, it demonstrated that, you know, the satellite technology, data communication can be used, but the companies which have a, a turnover of say 10 lakhs, how can they afford a satellite link which costs 64 lakhs? No, nobody could afford a link. And so this kind of combined this whole idea, and of course, the example came from Research Triangle Park, where everybody comes in a premises and they do things, but that could not be replicated for a software technology park, though the word park has been used. But here was a premises or a single window place where all the companies, uh, small companies could rent a space, one room, two room. They had a big uh, mainframe computer, a shared facility which they can access and a data link and which they could connect to the clients in US or they could hold a video conference initially. So all the facility, and of course, the biggest thing was that it provided the custom you know, benefits, you know, because if you are importing a computer, uh, you didn't have to pay uh, duties if you are going to export using that. So there are a lot of paperwork involved. So this facility provided everything under one, in, under one umbrella and one building. So this Metamorphosize, you know, that's the real story of the Indian IT industry, is SPPI. All the big companies of today, except TCS, which started much before, they were all incubated in SPPI. I have visited uh, uh, SPPI Bangalore even in the early 90s. There were hardly few companies, there were a lot of issues, but despite all that, this was an, an innovation that has grown and that has demonstrated the value of. How do you address? Because there was, if you remember, Santa Cruz export processing zone was there. So that model could not be applied. That was a manufacturing zone. 
it could not be applied to software so they needed to think creatively and this was a policy driven uh, innovation that has changed the face of the indian it industry of course uh, very briefly i'll talk about this this is one of the drugs which goes into the combination to treat hiv and this drug is made by several companies in hyderabad and other parts of india and because of the drug supplied by india the face that the the course of hiv pandemic globally has changed i mean nobody talks about hiv today it is treatable people live with their longer lives and all that as we used to talk about it in the 80s and 90s why uh, thanks to the indian company so this is one of the drug and this is uh, again uh, hepatitis b developed by this indian uh, hyderabad company called shanbag why i am showing this is here is a, a legal innovation that led to this whole process of indian companies developing capability to manufacture drugs using new processes of of patented drugs or drugs which are not patented in india that was a change which was made by the government in 1971 the new patent law so one of the reasons of uh, drugs being very costly in india that we allowed brand name patenting so all the multinationals would uh, manif- uh, or would patent their product elsewhere or in india and then sell so what this law did was it recognize process patent if there is a known drug if you develop a new process for it you can do that and that will be recognized as a patent so this was a game changer just as stpi changed the face of uh, the it industry the patent law rather incubated or rather you know triggered the growth of indian you know industry the pharmaceutical sector owes its existence to the patent law of course the labs helped them develop the processes indian companies did not have r and d so iict in hyderabad ncl in pune cdri in lucknow the government labs developed the new processes maximum were developed by in ncl and iict then the companies manufactured so same thing happened with uh, vaccines this is again a known uh, vaccine technology was known but we developed a new process and this was uh, marketed by manufactured and marketed by shanbag and look at the uh, the revolution that uh, led to it for example shanbag the market price uh, that time of uh, imported uh, vaccine was 23 dollars and this company came up with 1 dollar it again it went down even to a few cents later on so the margin the kind of uh, advantage which we gave to the world same thing happened with uh, it, the the azt combination used to cost 15000 so sipla said we'll give it for 1 dollar a day so 365 dollars a day you get this combo so that's how it changed the course of the uh, pandemic uh, the epidemic globally similarly 60% of the vaccines which are sold globally are manufactured in india today because we have the advantage so it is sometimes people try to you know undermine it saying that okay it's the reverse engineering but it is not exactly the reverse engineering because you know that there is the end product but you don't know how do you reach that point for that you needed to devise a process you need to to develop the manufacturing capacity and some of these are highly sophisticated uh, processes to make a vaccine which will withstand which will have the efficacy which will have you know still remain uh, at certain temperature and all those there is a whole which a complex process of course they are off patented or copied drugs you can say which western media always try to undermine saying that okay you are making cheap copies no they are not cheap copies they are innovate based on processes innovated in india i think that's what we need to appreciate when you talk of uh, i mean that's uh, and of course this everybody knows i don't need to dwell with it but the precursor to this uh, innovation which is on smartphones today was for the feature phones the npc at the national payment corporation of india in 2011 or 12 developed this uh, unified payment based on usdd whereby people could text and transfer money or get a statement so it was a text based key based you know uh, system developed for feature phones because when india government started looking at the financial inclusion the number of mobiles was increasing so they started with the feature phones but when the smartphone numbers went up later on 
and NPCI came up with this innovation, which is a completely different story. You need uh, several lectures to talk about it and very familiar how it has transformed the landscape. So these are some of the uh, randomly picked ideas from different, uh, I mean, these are some of other innovations which I'm not going to deal for paucity of time. I don't know how much time I've spent. So another five minutes I'll stop, but I'm not going to deal with all these uh, innovations, but I'll just touch, for example, egg revolution, it's a marketing idea. See, today you can buy eggs all over India, almost at the same price. This was not the case. For example, eggs in Bombay would cost you eight rupees a piece, or in Tamil Nadu, there'd be five rupees, or in Hyderabad, there'll be seven rupees. There'll be a lot of variation. And it was a cartel. And people would hold the eggs, the dealers, and then they will you know, uh, sell it at a higher price. So what Mr. B. V. Rao, who was a uh, poultry breeder, and he had already experienced the industry for about 20 years by 1980, you know, thought that why not? Uh, it, was a, it was a mechanism as a self-regulatory mechanism for prices. So he formed these unions of uh, uh, farmers and convinced them that let us sell at a uniform price. Don't make the middlemen make, uh, inflate the price to eight rupees or 10 rupees and sell them. So he devised a simple mechanism that wherever there is a shortage, you push the X in that market to bring down the price. And the, again, this is an offshoot of the STD revolution. That's the time when the STD phones became available. So people could easily connect, okay, what pe price is going on? rupees. Okay, you ship your uh, X to that market. So he devised this National Egg Coordination Committee. It was, a, it was a, a simple, there was no internet, nothing. So you couldn't do things online. So people will sit in Hyderabad, they'll talk to different people and they'll say, okay, today's price is this. So you, the farmers will sell at a uniform price all over India. So it was a price intervention done by a private entity. Government did not uh, intervene in this case. So that's how eggs became uh, available everywhere. Arvind Eye Care model is again a fantastic model whereby eye operations have been standardized. You know, normally hospitals don't follow uh, procedures like a factory kind of a thing. So when Dr. Uh, Govinda Swami thought of this model, he said, I want to McDonaldization of, you know, like I want to sell, do surgeries like a McDonald sells, you know, burgers. He saw it somewhere. So he wanted to standardize each procedure. So for example, in, in an operation theater, there'll be 10 beds so that you optimize the uh, available resources, the surgeon goes from one to another. That's how more surgeries could be done in less time, but at the same quality. So you ensure that. So that's a, a model which has gone all over the world. A lot of countries are following, a lot of hospitals within India have started following the Arvind Care model. And Sasha Revolution, again, is a classic case study in the marketing classes that how the very thought of selling a liquid item like a shampoo by Chick this Chinni Krishna kind of uh, opened up the whole market. Now, today everybody sells things in you know, small sachets. So he first thought of it because uh, of course only tea was sold in small packets before this. And he thought of uh, putting a liquid. So then you sell, uh, uh, suppose somebody is a daily wager who's earning 100 rupees a day. So he can't buy a shampoo bottle of 150 rupees, so, but he can still buy a shampoo that costs him one rupee or an oil packet, which cost him 50 pesa. So same concept was uh, adopted in the Chota recharge. You know, if you are going to recharge your phone for say 150 rupees or 300 rupees a month, but you can buy a recharge for five rupees. So it was aimed at uh, people who can afford that. That's one of the reasons for the mobile revolution to spread. So these are the micro micro things which have gone into doing. Then new institutions, we talk about the PPP model today, but all big institutions in India were formed in PPP model in 50s and 60s. For example, IIM Ahmedabad was a PPP model between the Ahmedabad Education Society, which gave the land, the state government, which funded the infrastructure, then the central government came together and Kasturbhai Lalbhai uh, was involved in the governing. So it was a PPP model, although it was not called a PPP model. All the national labs were set up with funding from the Tatas and the Birlas and the Dalmias. Industrial houses contributed to the starting of the national lab. Then the 
ex princely maharajas gave their palaces lucknow cdra is in a palace the jamnagar lab is in a palace mysore cf tara is in a palace so it was a ppp model in a different way so the new ways had to be thought of to create institutions and lot of institutions have come around which have become big and so i think so <clears throat> i have already mentioned that how indian innovation have gone and changed the world t dot is a massive thing and there are lots of figures how we change the communication all over the world std isd the kiosk model you know has been adopted by world bank and so many institutions all over the world but delivery evm is the example many countries are doing affordable medicines have changed the world the vaccines from india many countries have tried to uh, emulate then one aspect which i have not uh, touched upon for positive of time is grassroots innovations and you know, a lot of uh, ideas especially in agriculture have gone out from india and to african countries and up of course we are talking of ex exporting it to the world the whole as an idea so these are some of the pointers of the initial slide which i showed that we need to look at innovation in a different light out of technology out of you know uh, so it is a frugal use of technology like std it's a small technology it need not be big uh, upi involves big technology but at the end of the uh, at the consumer end it's uh, like uh, and all of them uh, served societal needs nobody advertised them they grew organically i don't think dot issued any ads that okay come and take the franchise people found it useful they went for it and there are sustained economic impacts of most of these innovations and uh, i want to emphasize that the state's role has been always important even after liberalization of 30 years after liberalization the state is still important upi is a state led innovation there are several other things which flow from the state people are looking to the state so i'm not saying that uh, uh, don't want to get into the deb debate of state versus market but i feel that uh, state's role has always been important and it continues to be so and one misnomer which i want all of you to give up from your minds is indian innovation is is a makeshift a kind of a shortcut you know it's not a shortcut and those uh, shortcuts are not uh, innovations they are just you know quick fixes which are not sustainable uh, people use different kinds and it's uh, become a fashion in this days of social media to say everything is innovation or even everything is uh, every jugaad is uh, innovations that's not the case we need to look at things how whether they are sustainable how where they are they replicable whether they are safe you know and do they have a wider impact so these are some of the Uh, issues which i wanted to flag and so i'm going to stop here and be happy to answer questions or hear your views thank you over to you sudhakar thank you sir thank you so much uh, i think this session is uh, this session is talking about uh, so many innovations that india has witnessed uh, in its journey from 1947 to now with uh, clear cut uh, goals and the benefits that it has provided the people and uh, largely it has captured an emotion that we all can be proud of we did have and we do have a lots of innovations and innovations that work for us innovations that have provided economic impact apart from the social impact and political impact and in uh, those innovations that we should be actually proud of in general some of these innovations are not talked about so the whole session can be termed as the less talked about innovations but having much much wider ramifications positive ramifications across the length and breadth of the country have been captured it is so refreshing and it is uh, very very important because every session on innovation that happens in india or outside india is only led by technology is only led by startups and it is in high tech and including the uh, uh, rocket science and things like that but this is common man's technology touching the lives and hearts of uh, millions and millions of people that india uh, actually talks about and boasts of uh, so it's like a common man's problems addressed and revolutionized and created impact and that is what it is all about thank you so much sir for putting it together i'm sure you will have many other interesting uh, tips and uh, perspectives to share so we'll conserve all the time for that and quickly jump into 
the first cluster of questions and answers, and uh, I'll request Professor Prasad to start the Q&A. Professor Prasad, thank you. Thank you, Professor Rao. So it has uh, given us a completely different view of what innovation is. Typically, when we discuss innovation, it is like the you know people, plan and profit kind of difference with, between profit and the PPP. So here you have brought in something which is far more uh, integrated view, and uh, I think which is even more important than. And obviously, if you can do that, you can do the other also. Uh, thank you very much for introducing that a very very India context uh, specific addressing the needs of India, all the innovations that you have uh, spoken about. A uh, number of uh, questions have been there about which are the most important innovations. I think you have covered that question in your uh, presentation. And perhaps you may name a few more when we go into the other questions. So given this uh, situation, what is your outlook for what can happen in the next uh, 25 years by the time we hit 100? So in on a similar context or where you have this sort of a a mindset that India generally has, uh, keeping aside maybe the profit-oriented ones. Uh, what 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 is your uh, take on the future of such innovation in India? I mean, it's uh, not easy to predict future, but yeah, one thing I'm not undermining profit. I mean, today we live in an era where you know social entrepreneurship is there, which is driven by some profit, but not profiteering, so to say. But uh, the notion that uh, innovation has to be basically a technology led and sometimes what happens in this whole race for startups, we are forgetting that why were we innovating? I believe that it should meet a, a felt need of the society or people, community, it could be anybody, but it should be a felt need, not, you're not trying to create a need for something, you know? And uh, sometimes the need is not, uh, completely obvious, it could be latent, but uh, a lot of uh, ideas which is in programs like Shark Tank, they discuss is okay, something that can make money, it can multiply, but it need not be based on a felt need or it need not be based on a ethical way of looking at things. But I believe that, yeah, if we are able to uh, address some of the micro needs, a lot of things which I discussed was macro, they are pan-Indian, but still, there are a number of, uh, uh, you know, sectors where we need to work and look at uh, uh, some of the basic needs are still unmet for a lot of Indians. So those are the areas, I think, which we need to focus in future, uh, looking at the same way, because now the avenues are much bigger. It is not just the state. There are other frameworks which are available. There is a lot of uh, kind of... Uh, uh, at least talk of collaboration between the formal institutions and informal institutions between academia. So in a lot of these uh, things which I discussed, except for say uh, a few institutions, things happen outside academia. So now academia is part of this uh, whole uh, triangle. So uh, we are uh, still looking at evolving some of those frameworks and how we carry on and still there is a need number of ideas which need to take to the market or do things to fulfill the needs basic needs of people and because all said and done we are a big country that at any given time millions of people are still needing seven basic things like you know water or portable medicines you can have uh, uh, medicines which are cheap but how do you make them accessible so there are a number of issues around uh, where we need to work Sir, in this context, uh, would you like to reflect on two other key sectors, say defense, uh, aviation, where there is a, I mean, at an overall level, there is definitely a felt need. But do you see any patterns from there similar to what you have said or what uh, we can do going ahead? Defense, it, I have not touched upon space, I have not touched upon atomic energy, I have not touched upon defense, because those are the areas where India needs to build capability and it has done so in many ways with a lot of investments like we're talking of quantum computing today we are talking of many other uh, missions we talked about supercomputing in the 90s so those are the core areas where we need to build capability where we want to have a stake so there's no there are no two ways of you know doing that we need uh, you know kind of uh, heavy investments in those areas but yeah when it comes to applications for example i'll touch upon space there's a whole gamut of applications which are opening up, you know. We don't need big satellites which uh, 
uh, take a hundred million dollars to make, you can have a micro uh, network of constellation of micro satellites, which can give you better coverage, you know, and which can have different applications. So those sectors are opening, which are really high tech, but in the area of application, there are new avenues which are opening, especially in this space. I can't think of many in atomic energy, but space, at least, there are a lot of uh, uh, applications are opening up and there are startups which are coming up. So new ways of doing things in space sector can happen. Of course, India has built a capability, but application part, uh, suppose you want a remote sensing uh, imagery of your own campus, you can't get it or your own farm. How do I get that? So there are uh, service providers, there are come defense, I'll core areas of defense are still a government domain, but there are a lot of technological spin-offs which can come to the general public, which can, and that's where the that's where the collaboration between DRDO and others would come. You know, just as it's happening in space. So there are certainly those are important areas. Thank you, sir. Uh, how do you compare the context in India and the evolution and are there any other countries which, you know, uh, where you'd like to highlight, give some perspective for uh, in a kind of a uh, perspective for the audience, some other countries fairly similar to India or maybe where India can learn from? I have not looked at from that point of view, but certainly a lot of things which I have mentioned were context specific. You know, we have done certain things responding to our context. Maybe Indonesia has done a few other things responding to their context. I'm sure the Brazil has done, South Africa has done, like the drug industry is developing in South Africa. So there are many countries which are doing, but uh, some of these uh, societal innovations are context specific. They, are, uh, they work in a certain uh, uh, socio-political environment. The policies are different. The way we responded to the emergence of new technology is different from the way which Brazil has done. Brazil was an open economy long time before India became. So there are comparisons are difficult, but yeah, a lot of things, there is a cross fertilization of ideas. A lot of people come here, they learn. We go out and learn some of those things. So there, that's possible, but uh, it's difficult to emulate a particular model. No, that's not a possibility, but See, some of the MNCs which work in India, they look at India as a, as a laboratory because the things which they develop here, they feel that they can take it to the rest of the developing world. So that's happening because a lot of things can be tested here because we have a, a, a different uh, uh, audiences for each product. So if you have one product, you can test it on different types of people at the high income, low income, you know, in rural areas. So some of those learnings people are doing back from India to I mean, a very small example, the Alu Tiki Burger, McDonald's did it for Indian market, then they took it elsewhere. So <laughs> things like that happen. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Another thing which is unique to India is what is playing out as a demographic window. And uh, it's been a, a few years since it started off. <clears throat> so is there anything keeping this in view? Again, it is uh, a context thing. There is a need for all these guys to become productive. And is there anything that you'd like to, it gets often talked about. Uh, how do you see this playing out? Uh, what are the criticalities with respect to the direction in which we go as a country? No, if you look at the demographic, demographic dividend, it can become dividend only when we have skilled manpower. Well, why did India do well in uh, IT and ITES and all the associated BPO and now engineering R&D and higher up the value chain because we could either we had a manpower or we could develop that necessary manpower with institutions, with mechanisms, with training program, and we could scale up. That's what the, that was the advantage. So certainly uh, a workforce uh, could be an advantage for a country like India, but it needs to be trained. It needs to be upskilled for the industry needs. You know? Because uh, today engineering is a basic degree and then industry has to train them, you know, make them employable. So can we do those tweaks and make our uh, workforce, you uh, know, useful in many other ways? For example, medical tourism, why do people come to here, India or why do uh, Indian nurses go abroad? Because that 
capability of training you know that has uh, been developed so maybe we could do that in hospitality maybe we could do it in uh, elderly care where the countries which are becoming older they will need a lot of people to take care of their old people so there are new avenues which keep opening up but we need a skilled manpower we need to train we need to reorient our education system uh, in identified areas i would say that and then certainly we can take advantage of the the demography changing demography can become a dividend thank you sir this mm. brings us to the uh, gets us to the next question now okay. uh, given this sort of a framework what do you think government academia and industry can do to step up the level of innovation today we are talking about uh, getting to be uh, you know the largest gdp or the second largest gdp in by the time we hit 100 so what what additionally can you see government doing academia doing industry doing to get there so all said and done i mean it's my standing and belief and what working in silo there's lot of talk about the industry academia and uh, research institutions coming together and some of it is being forced by the government to set up this incubator that incubator they come together there are you know networks form but unless that happened organically unless that uh, each of these you know entities the government the academia the research really kind of reinvents their own systems you cannot work like uh, today still i'm uh, maybe i'm wrong that a professor working in a university cannot uh, sit on a board of a company so we need to change all those things you know there are physically incubators set up in uh, universities but how much of interaction is happening between the university and that incubator or how much of interaction the university has with the uh, uh, industry around it and that's a classic thing which happened with iit kanpur you know at the end of the 10 years it was set up by these nine uh, universities including mit caltech and you know illinois and everything so the evaluation report at the end of it was written by the american professors and they said that uh, we wanted to create an indian mit not an mit in india so it was created as an as, a, an, as an island of excellence so the graduates had nothing to do in kanpur kanpur was a industrial area in the early 20th century or in the late 19th century and it had nothing to offer them there was no ecosystem there so just by transplanting an institute you cannot uh, make it a uh, silicon valley uh, the founders thought that we could do that so unless we do that we create an enabling environment create uh, connections between you know all the three things are going to be uh, first are being made i'm not saying that but we are still not there you know that's what i feel very important points are very important yeah. point needs to come into the mindset of each of the individual stakeholders to make uh, to actually work on these dots and get it connected yeah. thank you sir thank uh, you. one last question before i yeah. uh, end the question back uh, you paid a visit to the arctic so you would have also seen uh, you know what other countries are doing in a similar environment with sort of an objective is there anything anything that you would like to uh, present with respect to the you know the what others are doing and what we are doing and you know what is where does it get positioned situated no that uh, different subject altogether yes india has a stake in one of the few countries in the world which is a which is a research stake in both first in antarctica of course antarctica we have been there for a long time arctic we started going just i went in 2008 and india had gone there in 2007 but it was in a different part they went from the norwegian side and i had gone from the canadian side so uh, most of the stations are the norwegian side and now india is going to construct a permanent uh, base so far they had a rented premises you can rent that and run your lab but now the india is constructing a permanent base and arctic we have had a base for a long time so of course we need to be there uh, and india is an important member of the arctic council as an observer member and it may get a soon because the core members are people in the country surrounding the arctic and others who have a research base are an observer member so india has a stake in the arctic as a research uh, entity and uh, it's a 
again a question of how much uh, you want to put money because if you want to have your own ice breaker you need to invest a lot otherwise you are also going to hire uh, ice breakers all those issues are there and when i went it was things were in very nascent stage as far as india was concerned and i didn't go to the indian station i was part of an uh, international expedition in a, on an ice breaker which was moving around the circumpolar for a year so i was there for about 3 uh, 4 weeks it was on the canadian side so it was a, a good experience and uh, again it's a multidisciplinary a lot of institutions are involved so when i went i found lot of uh, you know researchers from different uh, canadian universities were there different universities from other countries and europe were there there were a couple of indian students were also there so so those uh, linkages were there from the university and here also there are university linkages between national institute of uh, oceanography national institute of polar research and all that but yeah we need to do much more i would say compared to say big ones like you know canada or uh, even china has a big presence in arctic uh, antarctica we have been there and we have permanent stations to two stations are there no the new one is very fabulous but arctic yeah we we are, we are just beginning we are there for hardly 10 12 years now thank you sir thank you. thank you for highlighting the opportunity there and the need to do much more than perhaps what we are doing currently we come to the end of this cluster i hand it back to professor rao thank you sir thank you very much this is uh, one of the most involved conversations that i have seen in the recent past uh, uh, large number of people are uh, sending their questions also but of course we'll economize on that but uh, why is it so engrossed why it's so involved is because it is talking about uh, some of the things that we can look around and relate to and take pride in so i think that that's the that's the whole uh, uh, way you have made it very very interesting for us it is not the pie in the sky kind of a uh, uh, presentation it is more on the ground next to you in your neighborhood kind of uh, innovations that we can count on and I've, i'm sure the projection is we would have many such innovations as we march towards the 100th year of india's uh, independence uh i will also like to uh acknowledge the fact that the people who have joined and on the screen today uh we have many leaders who have joined uh, from all walks of life we have professor mahendra reddy our uh, our advisor distinguished advisor who has joined uh welcome sir and uh, some questions some people have already raised their hand uh, i will go to them but i let me uh, take one question and then see how we can uh, save some time sir after that uh at a cognitive at, at at a level that we understand innovation now before you commence the talk and after you commence the talk so this question is relevant and we need to take it up that is is innovation a learned cognitive behavior or a societal carry over that is what one of the participants would like to understand from you no it's a difficult question as i said i'm not an academician and i not going to theorize but uh, it's a mix of uh, everything of course uh, if you look at the mind of innovator they think differently there have been many studies you know done uh, what why people want to innovate you know why do they think of doing some new things especially uh, people who are not in the formal systems you know people who are school dropouts or people who are you know a number of people do things on their own and why do they do that so there are a number of uh, you know reasons for that they, of course cognitive level is one of them but the things which we discuss today are in response to a need there's always a need for example i attended one of these uh, innovation fairs where school kids you know uh, innovate so one girl had uh, developed a walker with an adjustable uh, legs so i asked her that why did you do that so she said that my grandmother is there and uh, because the legs of a walker are fixed so she fell off while you know using it on a stair so she thought oh, why not make it adjustable so this is a this is a small idea it may not become a commercial success it may not become a, a huge product uh, to be sold but things like that people think in response to what they see you know i mean in today's world it's important to find a problem you may have a solution but you know most of the time what happens is you have a product but you need to find a problem so 
the innovations which uh, are in response to a felt need, a response to what you see in your environment, uh, are the ones which really, you know, come out and may or may not become a commercial success, but yeah, they respond to a felt need, I would say. So yeah, it's a process and your environment, your upbringing, everything, there's no class for innovating. You can't have, you can't do a course on innovation and you can't become an innovator, just as you don't do an entrepreneurship course and you become an entrepreneur, same way. So people have different motivations for doing things. Even a scientist, for example, this scientist in one of the labs in uh, Bangalore has uh, developed, uh, it's a high tech uh, is a, uh, innovation, a developed kind of a, <clears throat> a lotion which farmers can apply on their skin when they are uh, uh, no, spreading the pesticides so that when the pesticides come to their skin, it gets disintegrated. So it's a chemical kind of a thing, you know, innovations. Why did, but why did he think about it? I always ask people that, how did you get this idea? So he comes from, incidentally, from Telangana. So he said that I used to see in my village, people, you know, using, uh, spreading fertilizer and chemical pesticide in their farms, not using any protective mask and, getting affected. So he said, why not devise, when he became a scientist, he thought of that, <coughs> addressing that problem. So it was somewhere at the back of his mind. So he didn't do that as a child, but when he did that, when he became a scientist. So your upbringing, your everything counts. So there's no method in madness, I would say, but yeah, everything matters. Everything matters. There could be various reasons that uh, we can get onto the street of innovation, but largely, <laughs> is based on, an, uh, on a challenge or a problem that one encounters and then it triggers us on the path for uh, innovation. And as you have cited many examples, uh, uh, it, can, it cannot be categorized as a cognitive uh, action. Uh, on, on, on the other hand, it cannot be totally said that it is only uh, in, in response to the need. But if it is in response to the need and these innovations will go towards impacting large number of people in our society. I think that's that more or less we figure it out uh, where it comes from. Of course, environment, upbringing and all. Um, yes, we will have a small debate a little later, sir, on uh, you will not uh, become an entrepreneur just by studying an entrepreneurship course. We will bring in one more person for that debate a <laughs> little later. <laughs> uh, yes, but that's interesting. Sir, uh, another question before I take one question from the audience is, uh, how many innovations do you think in India have been patented post-independence? Uh, are we also keeping track of these things or we, we are just happy with the societal impact that it is making and we are celebrating it or just enjoying the benefits of this innovation? Are we patenting it, the, these innovations also? Uh, I don't think any of the ideas which I discussed are patented because some of them are processes, some of them have taken a number of years to develop, but uh, no. Yeah, products maybe, for example, I think Nutan stove was patented because it was just one product. So things like that might have been patented. That's for sure that was patented. It's written also there on the stove itself because it was a design innovation. It was a energy efficiency innovation. So things like that have been patented, but I'm sure you can't patent something like STPI. The, you can patent a trademark, but not an, as an idea because these are, complex things, a mixture of several things, maybe individual technologies that went into C dot or including the C, the meter which was used in ISD, maybe some of those individual components might have been patented, but uh, uh, only the things which have a record are the institutionals, institutional innovations uh, which have been patented. For example, there will be a record of how many patents CSIR has filed or you know the number of other institutions, but things which happen in the society or which are disseminated, they are not usually not patented. So it's difficult to say how many, but yeah. Again, patent, the very concept of patent is an institutional you know, idea. So you want to protect your IP or you are happy that people take it and adapt it and you know, do things like that. So there are, uh, there are some uh, innovators I'm, meet a very particular about patenting. There are some which feel that, okay, you can adapt it your own way. 
uh, so that it has a wider dissemination. But yeah, now there is a kind of a focus on uh, patenting, yeah, certainly. And the whole your drug industry is based on the patents and off patent, the whole debate around patents. So certain categories, yes, they are uh, dependent on patents. Or, But the whole thing about the focus on patent is there's no point in increasing the number of patents unless you are able to monetize them. So there are a number of uh, uh, institutions. Uh, Dr. Mashelkar was there as director general of CSIR. He laid a lot of thrust on patenting. But how many of those patents have reached the market? Unless you are not able to do that, uh, that's no use. But when commercial entities patent, they do it with a different you know, idea. You have the a patent tree so that you know, you are uh, patenting everything around your main innovation so that nobody is able to even adapt things out of that. So there are, again, uh, different uh, uh, motivations for patenting. Institutions do it for their own reasons. Companies do it for their own reasons. And some uh, you know, individual innovators are also doing that. But yeah, uh, it's difficult to put a number, I would say. Yeah, I'm sure there are some studies, some records here and there. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much for the detailed response. Sir. So another uh, way of looking at it is uh, the political innovation that you talked about is a midday wheel scheme. And uh, it has clearly uh, laid out what is called an impact on multiple parameters that will measure India's growth. Uh, the indices were very, very positive and dependent on this particular innovation that they have uh, uh, first started in Tamil Nadu and subsequently caught up with across uh, various schools and colleges in India. Would you look at, uh, would you look at reservations as an innovation in itself? Has it not had benefits? Uh, what's your perspective on this? Uh, one of the participants wanted to understand whether within this lens of looking at innovations, can we also bring in reservations as a political innovation, which has got wider dissemination, impacting large number of people and uh, there is there is affordability taken into care and uh, and therefore is it a political innovation according to you if so why was it not listed uh, so i have not looked at uh, this whole issue from uh, the framework which i discussed with you and uh, it may not be in the same category as say icds the mid day meal scheme because uh, this was something which was uh, as a constitutional guarantee, you know, it was enshrined in the constitution. So it's difficult to put it in the same category as a midday meal, as a political uh, innovation. But yeah, that's a constitutional guarantee. You can, uh, uh, but uh, some other schemes I have discussed in my book is on the employment guarantee scheme and things which came out, you know, later on, which were not there in the constitution originally or in the legal framework earlier even low kadalat and a lot of things which have, uh, uh, there are innovations in other sector, but I'll not put reservation in the same category as, you know, as a political innovation. Fine, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think uh, to read almost all the examples, uh, we'll have to go to Amazon and buy the book. Uh, I have shared the link with the audience okay. and also Thank the you. image of the cover page, uh, that the book that you published recently. I'm sure uh, we are all keen uh, in knowing a little more about uh, the entire list of innovations that you have uh, chosen to talk about. Uh, thank you so much, sir. I'll open the mic for one of the members in the uh, audience. Uh, 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 Lavanya ji, would you like to take the question over to you? Good evening, sirs. Thanks a lot for the wonderful presentation. I have a couple of queries. Uh, first thing is regarding the PCO revolution, you had mentioned policy innovation. So the then chairman of National Knowledge Commission, Sam Petroda, sir, and his role in bringing out the PCO revolution. Can you just uh, talk about that? And the other one is regarding patents. The Indian Patents Act was um, passed in 1970 and the amendment was made in 2005. So was it after the amendment that the process patents came into the pictures? Previously, it was only product patent or? No, you are mixing up two uh, periods. So when Sam Petroda did the innovation, he was not the National Knowledge Commission chairman. He became, that was uh, during uh, Dr. Manmohan Singh's time. 
But uh, during Rajiv Gandhi's time, he was the head of the technology missions and uh, telecom uh, mission was one of them. So yeah, it was his idea to circumvent this, you know, privatization and keep the intact of uh, monopoly of DOT. So that was his idea. So he worked that out and whole idea of uh, kiosk uh, uh, sort of originated from his thinking. So that's uh, one you, you asked on Sam Pitroda. Yes. Sir. Okay. The second one is the patent law. See, 71, the law was changed from 47 or even before that was the product patent. But 71, it was made a process patent. So up to 2005, it remained that. So that is the period of the growth of the Indian, you know, pharmaceutical and pharma industry. And after that, because of the WTO, we had to change the law again. So that followed later on. But what happened is a lot of off, see, in, during this period, we developed capability to develop our own drugs, our own new processes, and manufacturing was perfected. So that period, it's a long period from 70s to up to 2005. So that was the golden period of uh, Indian pharma industry, I would say. So they made full use of it. Even now, off patent drugs can be manufactured in India. So we are still, so the, the change happened from process, uh, product to process in 71 and it lasted till 2005. I was saying thank you, Lavanya ji, for raising those interesting questions. Uh, thank you, sir. There is one more uh, uh, friend who is uh, planning to ask you a question. Uh, Mr. Banotu Sai Prasanna, would you like to, yeah, please unmute yourself and uh, ask the question if you're ready. Okay. Uh, while he catches up, uh, we'll take one more question, sir. In our journey uh, on these uh, innovation, innovation transformation that is taking place, uh, what do you think in the next few years or in the next one decade, which one should be the number one innovation or couple of innovations that will place India ahead? Because everything that we are talking about is India centric and uh, what India needs uh, in which segment of innovation uh, do you think uh, we need to focus on and then try to march ahead and stay ahead of others? Oh, it's very difficult to pinpoint one area or two areas, but uh, we have identified certain areas, you know. See, right now we are looking at the next set of technologies, you know. We are moving ahead of digital, we are talking of web 4.5 or whatever, we are talking of internet of things and, you know, a new set of technologies, quantum computing and use of drone technology and new technologies are emerging. So it is not just technology per se. I believe that it is the applications of those technologies which will you know, lead to new products and services. And that's where we need to concentrate. But of course, we need to build the capacity uh, as we did in ITO, I saw IT, ITS and BPO and other engineering services. So in the next you know, phase, we need to look at some of those uh, emerging areas and develop capacity into that and then develop applications around those. So it is not just the space technology which is going to solve. Technology has been there. So it's the applications which are going to change the world or you know, going to be useful. But that's where I think the working together between research institutions and some of the big organizations need to think. And of course, some areas are identified, but 20 years back, did anybody think that UPI will become big or microfinance will micro payments will become this big? No. So things evolve. And again, uh, uh, how fast you are able to, today we are talking of chat GPT. So maybe we need to think of new applications of that in the Indian context, the artificial intelligence. How do you overcome certain challenges to use? Do we, how do we make uh, these AI devices uh, you know, suitable for Indian languages. Many of them don't understand the Indian accents and multiple. So those challenges are there still. So how do we make them work for us? So that's again an area of research or we need to invest in those sectors. Yeah. So yes, the horizon is there, but how do we make use of that? How do we prepare and how do we uh, develop applications based on that? Thank you. Great, sir. Great. I think it is consistently coming out that uh, we need to focus on the applications, wider applications that you can uh, field, wider applications that you can identify and work on. I think that the impact will be much larger. 
Yeah, thank you, sir. So there, there, there was another question which you answered with your previous response that was about uh, artificial intelligence, uh, what is kind of addressed. The question was, uh, what are the pros and cons of artificial intelligence? And uh, unless you, you want to say a little more about something specific to AI, how it replaces industrial employees in future, and therefore how it has to be, what are the pros and cons of AI? That was the question. Uh, if you want to speak a little more on that, we will wait for that, sir. Otherwise, yes. I'll go to the second floor. Next no, floor. I'll just uh, spend a minute because it is the same sort of questions that raised whenever a new technology emerges. You know, somebody shared on uh, Twitter an old picture of uh, when the cars came, people said, oh, horses are good enough. Why do we need this uh, beast on the engine in, uh, on the road? So, so we always uh, look at uh, new technologies with certain amount of skepticism. But we need to engage with them. That's what I believe. So, and AI is one of them. Let's not brush it aside saying that, okay, we have natural intelligence is good enough for us. We don't need artificial intelligence. But that's not the way to deal with it. Yeah, of course, it is going to impact your workplaces. Of course, it is going to impact certain class of you know, uh, types of uh, works we do. But uh, how do we engage with that and benefit from that? That's what uh, we need to do with any kind of technology. When robotics came, people said, okay, they are going to replace uh, robotics has been there for 30 years now, but has it uh, replaced human beings? No, but we needed to engage with them where certain processes have become autom automated because of use of robotics. Same way uh, when intelligence, uh, artificial intelligence is getting integrated in whatever we do, our smartphones already have artificial intelligence, the laptops already have elements of AI. So how do we make use of those and let's engage with technology, that's the, Challenge. Great, sir. Great. Thank you so much. Let's engage with technology and see how it benefits us uh, rather than you know staying stuck with what is called uh, the skepticism generally evoked when you, I mean, when there's an advent of new technology or an emerging technology. Thank you, sir. So one uh, last question I would like to take, uh, and that is, uh, what is your uh, suggestions to NGOs in the sphere of uh, climate change? Uh, what do you think a couple of things that they can work on at a micro level? Climate change is a very, very macro issue, but then uh, corrections on the axis of climate change will begin at micro level. So what role do you envisage and what suggestions you have for some of the NGOs? Because I see some of the NGO friends also who have joined on their behalf, I'm asking this question. Oh, that's an interesting question. And... Uh... Of course, I've been writing on climate change and had some uh, opportunity to visit uh, all the states in Northeast and look at the changes which are occurring because the first changes which are being felt due to my, uh, you know, climate change are in the hills and, uh, and the coastal areas and also in the plains, so to say. So what the role uh, uh, the civil society or NGOs can have is to work with the communities. See, the larger question in climate change is, can we mitigate it? So that's uh, that's been the question for 20 years now, that who brings down the emissions and how do we control even the latest reports also show that the emissions are going up and we are going to reach that tipping point and all that. So that's one uh, way of looking at climate change. The other one is how do we adapt to it? And that's where I think the role of uh, grassroots organizations and NGOs come is, how do we prepare our communities to adapt to climate change? Because they are the ones who are feeling it most. And it's not just a question of, you know, increasing the thermostat of your AC by one degree, okay, we can uh, do that. No, that's for us, but people on the ground, people in the farm, people in the coastal area, people in the hills are already feeling the impact. So that's where, we need to handhold them and to adapt to the new technologies, which could be farming, which could be a water you know, conservation you know, uh, uh, method or whatever in kind of intervention. So uh, civil society organizations have a big role in helping the communities to adapt to climate change in different ways. It, again, it's a local, it's a context specific, it varies from region to region, but yeah, uh, communities, are aware of the changes, but how do we make them uh, live with those changes? That is uh, where I think the role of uh, people on the ground and NGOs comes into picture. And 
lot of organizations are doing. For example, there are organizations working in the coastal areas where they have trained uh, people. They are called citizen scientists. You know, they uh, are collecting data on how the coastline is shifting because scientists are not there everywhere. They look at the satellite images and then they model and tell you the picture, but it has to be correlated with the situation on the ground. So people are being trained to measure that, you know. Okay, last year the line was here, but this season it is here. So they are there on the ground, so they are even contributing to data. So there are various roles uh, NGOs uh, and civil society organizations can take up uh, when it comes to climate change. It could be data collection, as I said, it could be adaptation, it could be awareness, it could be working with the communities. Thank you. Amazing, sir. I think it's a clear cut uh, suggestion for uh, civil society to play an active role in uh, mitigating the climate change impact uh, uh, and also embracing uh, this change meaningfully by engaging with the community and creating awareness, collection of data, so on and so forth. Thank you so much, sir. And uh, uh, <clears throat> Uh, Professor Prasad, would you have any question before we wrap it up? Uh, uh, I'm I'm not taking that route of uh, debate on uh, entrepreneurship course versus entrepreneur. We'll do it some other time. But other than that, I think we have covered uh, much territory in a new fashion. So that's Correct. a good beginning. Yeah. I'm extremely happy. This session has been a refresher kind of a session for us, sir. But we can't actually thank you enough for your time and uh, involvement and energy in uh, taking us through this landscape of innovation that India has witnessed uh, since 1947 until now. And the spirit of innovation that is actually raging uh, very nicely, and I'm sure it is going to go, uh, it's going to take us for the next 25 years as well and even beyond. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, this uh, transformation that India has made from uh, being a freshly uh, uh, independent democratic republic and how it has reached to a stage of a thriving nation. I think that entire spectrum has been beautifully covered by you. Not only it is interesting uh, for the big changes, but it is also interesting for the small and micro innovations that you have covered and, and uh, try to focus our, bring our focus on the fact that these are notions around innovation that we are often mired in. I think uh, we mistake all these innovations as you got the quick fixes. But I think today's session has given us an opportunity to appreciate and celebrate uh, the high impact uh, innovations, the wider impact innovations that India has uh, witnessed. Uh, <clears throat> the disruptions that revolutionized uh, various sectors that you covered, including uh, uh, science, uh, healthcare, education, governance. Governance were very important uh, examples that you've given. Business, of course grassroots movements, you talked about agriculture innovation, fashion and law. I am sure the range of innovations that you have uh, uh, covered is very, very interesting. And uh, I'm sure we will read the book and try and understand a little more about uh, the people who are behind these and what we needed to understand and know about the less talked about people, the people behind these interesting innovations also uh, have to be uh, celebrated, first recognized. And I'm sure it's going to be an interesting read. I request all the others to click on the Amazon link uh, at their convenient time, note that, and uh, reach out for the book. So on behalf of everyone here, sir, uh, on behalf of the ICFI team, on behalf of Professor Prasad and all the participants, I, I would like to uh, wholeheartedly extend our gratitude. We'd like to thank you for uh, providing us this uh, very, very insightful and uh, interesting uh, session this evening. Thank you once again uh, very much, sir. Thank you. I enjoyed it thoroughly. I think it was a very meaningful conversation. I really like the questions. I think it's good to have such conversations rather than in a one way kind of a thing that uh, I really enjoyed. And thanks for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, sir. We will Thank come you. back to you with uh, additional questions that we have. We'll write an email to you and you can respond. We could, we could probably share that. Uh, additionally, we are going to make a summary of this uh, entire session. Uh, uh, then we'll share a, a draft copy of summary with you. Once you approve it, add and delete. Uh, we will put it back on our uh, with your approval on our uh, archive, so that the video recording as well as uh, this uh, uh, summary in a text form will be available for anybody to go onto our website and review that at, at their convenient time. 
So we will come back to you for that, sir, in a, in a couple of days uh, from now. Thank you. I appreciate uh, all the effort you're putting in. You know, it's a knowledge which needs to be shared. So I think ITPA is uh, doing a great job in that. Uh, thank, 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 thank you. you. Thank, thank you so you. much, sir. We also try to innovate uh, in our own possible manner by bringing in some of the cutting edge uh, uh, programs which are available abroad to India and making it available to the doorsteps of uh, various small towns in this country. Professor Prasad has handled a huge uh, uh, initiative on behalf of ICWAI in the, in the last decade. And uh, we have opened uh, management schools across 170 locations in this country, which nobody else has done. And uh, we have understood that it, the quality education has to go to the nook and corner of this country. And uh, with that mission, with a huge set of operations that were handled by Professor Prasad himself, and with that mission, we have realized various other possibilities and happenings, and we have rolled out our large format campuses across the country. Today, we have 11 universities, uh, uh, nine ICFI business schools, uh, seven ICFI techs, eight ICFI law schools, so on and so forth. Uh, we are present in about uh, 16 states with uh, roughly about 20 campuses uh, in various parts of the country. Oh, so, <laughs> thank you, sir. Thank you. You have triggered us, uh, triggered many thoughts in us. We would like to take uh, some of the learnings back home into applying it in our own domain and uh, probably keep in contact with you and request you to visit us whenever it's convenient to you in any society. Sure. Okay. Sorry, in any city that uh, you may be traveling in. Okay, sir. Thank you once again to the audience. I want to thank. Uh, uh, for your patient listening. Uh, we will be seeing you again uh, next Friday. That is on uh, um, that is on 26th of May at 6.30 p.m. We are going to bring to you yet another leader, Mrs. Madhavi Lata, and she's going to talk about the primary job of leadership. And it's going to be very, very interesting. Uh, we, will, we will send a communication to you and uh, we hope to see you back. Uh, till then, read about India's innovation journey. Click on that Amazon link and pride yourself for what you have gone through and what you have actually enjoyed and then put a name to it called innovation. Till then, take good care and thank you and see you next week. Good night to all of you.